Welcome everyone to today's program. I am Laura Deirdre with Beckers Healthcare. The program will begin with a presentation and we will have a question and answer session following the completion of the presentation. You can submit any questions you have throughout the presentation by typing them into your control channel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during this time. You will receive an email within about a week following the webinar that will include instructions for how you can download a copy of the presentation. You will also receive a follow-up email shortly after the completion of the program. You can submit your feedback or any additional questions at that time. This email will not include the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter. Dr. Roger Hartle is a professor of neurological surgery and director of spinal surgery and neurotrauma at Wheel Cornell Brain and Spine Center in New York. In addition, he is the founder and co-director of the Wheel Cornell Spine Center and serves as the neurosurgeon for the New York Giants football team. Dr. Hartle's clinical interest focuses on simple and complex spine surgery, minimally invasive spine surgery, and computer-assisted spinal navigation surgery. Dr. Heidel has been repeatedly named to a list of New York, New York super doctors, America's top surgeons, and America's best doctors, and has been included on a list of New York's best doctors in New York Magazine. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Dr. Heidel to begin today's presentation. Yeah, hi, thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, kind introduction. My name is uh, Roger Hartle. I'm a neurosurgeon in, in New York at Dual Cornell. Uh, I, um, I am a spine surgeon. I specialize on spinal surgery. I, uh, I want to talk today uh, or this evening uh, about uh, uh, the role of microsurgery and, uh, and navigation in minimal invasive spinal surgery. It's, it's, it's a real pleasure. I want to thank uh, the Becca Healthcare team, uh, Laura, who uh, you just heard, and then Caitlin, uh, and then um, the folks from Zeiss uh, who kind of uh, made this possible uh, for having me here. And um, so, so what, what I'm going to do over the next uh, 40, 45 minutes is I want to tell you a little bit about kind of where I came from in my evolution as a minimum invasive spine surgeon and what, what I consider really important principles and ideas uh, within uh, minimum invasive surgery. Obviously, microsurgery is a very important part of that, but there are several other things also that really all come together uh, and allow us to perform less invasive and minimum invasive surgery successfully. And I, I want to try to keep it very basic, uh, and, uh, and, and I hope that uh, uh, those of you who have an interest in, in minimum invasive surgery will get the most out of this. Unfortunately, uh, this is a, uh, a webinar, so uh, uh, there's no direct interaction other than re really you asking questions. And I wanna encourage all of you uh, to submit questions. And at the end of the webinar, we'll, we'll try to answer uh, all of those uh, appropriately and, and successfully. So um, uh, when we talk about minimal invasive spinal surgery, um, what we talk about is really an evolution of surgery that has occurred over the last decades. And, and there are several areas within surgery uh, that came together and, that, that really uh, allows, uh, allow us now as a spine surgeon to perform less invasive uh, spinal surgery successfully. For example, we have access strategies now to virtually every part of the spine with percutaneous or mini open or tubular approaches. Uh, we're much better microsurgeons now than we were maybe 10 or 20 years ago, especially uh, neurosurgery residents obviously are being exposed to operating under the microscope, but increasingly also orthopedic residents uh, are being trained under the microscope uh, or the endoscope. Uh, so that really benefits any surgeon who wants to become uh, an MI spine surgeon. Uh, we've worked with uh, engineers, with companies, and uh, 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 other uh, uh, technologists to, to, to uh, develop instrumentation techniques that uh, uh, allow and enable minimal invasive surgery, pedicle screw system, cages, and so forth. And then finally, navigation is very important. Uh, I, uh, I think it's obvious if you, if you don't have good visualization of the anatomy because you're doing everything percutaneously, 
or through a very small incision, it is important that you have a way to navigate and visualize the anatomy. And 2D and 3D stereotactic navigation, in my, in my uh, opinion, are very, very important to really facilitate this and will become increasingly important as our uh, interest in, in MIS surgery uh, grows and, uh, and as technology also gets better in terms of navigation. Now, um, uh, what we really want to achieve as, as MIS spine surgeon is we want to uh, improve our patient's outcome. And, and we want to do this by using procedures that cause less uh, collateral tissue damage, measurable decrease in mobility, more rapid functional recovery than traditional exposures. However, without differentiation in the intended surgical goal, and hopefully actually with an improvement, with a better uh, uh, outcome than, than what used to be achieved with traditional open surgery. And these goals and, and this definition of MIS surgery was recently published here in this publication. Uh, and, and we're trying to get there. You know, I think there's no real good level one evidence that we're there yet, but there's a lot of studies that are coming out that show that increasingly we're really approaching this goal. And the, the basic idea of MIS surgery is to protect, especially in the lumbar spine as an example here, is to protect those muscle groups that are so important for our patient's recovery and post-operative uh, activity. So we want to avoid muscle injury with MIS surgery by using muscle splitting self-retaining retractors, by limiting the width of the surgical corridor, by using known anatomic neurovascular and muscular planes, and by protecting muscle attachments. For example, this is an MRI scan of a patient who had an open laminectomy here. You can see uh, the tremendous amount of uh, uh, scar tissue and muscle injury in the back. And, um, and that's obviously something that does not really play well in, in this patient's post-operative recovery. Cho Kim uh, published a lot of this and a lot of the scientific kind of background uh, for those of you who are interested. Um, uh, I was in Pittsburgh as a visiting professor a few weeks ago and I, I, I met uh, Dr. Joe and I remember when I was, uh, when I was interviewing uh, for neurosurgery residency, which is uh, a number of years ago now, 15, you know, 15, almost 20 years ago, I met with Dr. Joe, and at the time when we was, were interviewing, he showed me in the office, he showed me a syringe, and he told me uh, 15, 20 years ago that he was uh, operating through syringes, and I thought at the time that was totally crazy. That was for the spine. Well, what happened, obviously, and, and as we talk about in this presentation, is operating through syringes or through tubular retractor really has become now almost standard of care, at least in North America, and, and that's really where the evolution has gone, and I think... Uh, and I, and I found that very interesting to kind of see him again and, and kind of uh, reflect on, on the history of mineral invasive spinal surgery that way. Now, tubular retractors and many other tools and, and uh, uh, techniques have become really common uh, knowledge now for MIS surgery. So we have uh, the tubular retractors, uh, the microscope is very important. Some surgeons uh, use percutaneous endoscopes or uh, endoscopes to tube still and then navigation. And these are really kind of the gadgets and the technical, uh, uh, the, the techniques that we use to really make MIS surgery possible. And then instrumentation, for example, expandable cages here. Uh, and a lot of this has been published in publications, for example, in this book, lasers, uh, obviously I have not, not a big role as, as most of you probably know right now. Now the microscope, uh, uh, and, and since we're talking about microsurgery in, in this presentation a lot, I want to give you um, uh, or remind you a little bit where the microscope came from. It was really uh, introduced as a surgical microscope in the 1950s. And then uh, uh, Theodore Kurtz was a neurosurgeon in, in California in 1957, who uh, did the first kind of documented neurosurgical procedure under the microscope. And then it was really Yasser Gill and Kaspar in Switzerland and in Germany who really routinely started using the microscope for lumbar microdiscectomies. And this was published in 1977, independently by both authors. And then in the US, it was Williams in, in, in Las Vegas, who, who, who uh, had the first publication using the microscope routinely for microsurgical uh, lumbar microdiscectomy. The, the advantages of using the microscope are pretty obvious. There are very little disadvantages. And, uh, and uh, I'm not going to go through all of these, but you know, just as a reminder, Yasser Gil, uh, even though better known for his vascular uh, neurosurgery contributions, was really also a pioneer in using the microscope for spinal surgery. And then, and then in the US, it was Williams who practiced in Las Vegas and did a lot of these uh, dancers. 
uh, and uh, really popularized uh, the microscopic microsurgical lumbar microdiscectomy in North America. Well, uh, as, as, um, as we know, there are now um, MIS approaches for virtually every part of the spine. We can do minimum basis spinal surgery in the cervical spine, thoracic, lumbar spine, uh, from the front, from the back, combined. Uh, most commonly, probably, is really uh, minimum basis spinal surgery in the lumbar spine. And, and for the remainder of the talk, I will probably uh, really focus on that. And the, um, and the advantages are kind of obvious. Uh, the incision is, a, is almost like a, a, a side effect, but it, it, is, it le leads to less soft tissue damage, less blood loss, lower complication rates, less scarring, shorter hospital stay, quicker, quicker return to daily activities of, of living. And uh, uh, for many uh, procedures now, we have really good evidence that this is actually true. For some procedures, we don't know for sure yet, but we suspect that it is true. Uh, the, the, what I would consider the principles of spinal MIS, and that's what I want to talk about today, is uh, the contralateral decompression that you can achieve through tubular retractors, which is quite impressive and remarkable. The fact that by using tubular retractors, you minimize the iatrogenic instability that you can uh, cause when you do, for example, a lumbar laminectomy. And the fact that by putting in cages, you can achieve indirect decompression. Those, in my opinion, are the most important principles of spinal MIS surgery. And, and I want to give examples for all of those. And then uh, at the end of my talk, I want to talk a little bit about how the latest generation of 3D navigation technology really facilitates MIS surgery and go, goes hand in hand with all of these principles and really allowing us to integrate then also instrumentation surgery into middle invasive spinal surgery and really make it uh, a whole and really kind of make it uh, as a package, as an MIS package uh, that allows us to do these operations very effectively, efficiently, and uh, successfully. So, so let's talk first about contralateral decompression. And so you can perform a bilateral decompression and the contralateral foraminotomy through a unilateral minimally invasive approach. Now, this is not new. This has been described already in the 1990s by uh, Dr. Spetska from Europe uh, in, uh, in cadavers with open surgery. So he showed this in open surgery that you can, you can do a unilateral laminotomy, laminotomy and you can uh, uh, reach both parts of the lumbar spine and decompress those. And then he also did that, he showed that in a series of patients. In North America, this was really then shown and popularized by McCullough, who published that in this uh, remarkable book that, was, uh, that came out in 1998, where he also showed that with open spinal surgery, you can achieve a bilateral decompression through a unilateral approach. Uh, now, this was then um, really uh, translated into a minimal invasive surgery uh, by the work of you know, Kevin Foley and others who introduced tubular retractors uh, that instead of cutting the muscle, they dilate the muscle. You go in from one side, so it's a unilateral approach. Uh, but then uh, you, can, uh, you can access the spine with minimal invasive uh, uh, invasion. And then uh, Sylvain Palmer, to my knowledge, was the first one who actually really described the, this kind of combination of the tubular retractor, but then using it for a unilateral approach for bilateral decompression, uh, so for treatment of lumbar spinal stenosis. And this was published in the early 2000s by, by Sylvain Palmer and is now really uh, routinely done by many uh, surgeons, including myself, in the treatment of lumbar spinal uh, stenosis. So, uh, so we use, uh, you know, this is a tubular retractor, commonly used tubular retractor today. I personally I like these black uh, retractors because under the microscope there's less reflect, uh, reflection. Some of these retractors are, are silver. Um, and I use a 22 uh, millimeter retractor for a TILA for a fusion, an 18 millimeter for lumbar laminectomy, and a 15 or 16 millimeter retractor for microdiscectomy. And uh, some of our patients come already tattooed with uh, the access port, uh, as a joke, I apologize. And, um, and we use the microscope uh, routinely, as you can see here, we, we uh, project it on the screen in the operating room. So everybody in the operating room team knows exactly what we're doing. This one of our chief residents a few years ago doing the case. 
And the, adva the, you know, the advantages are obvious. Instead of doing a, a big open laminectomy, a big skin incision, removing the spinous process, all the ligamented structures here, bilateral exposure, you can do this now with a small opening, uh, unilateral approach for bilateral decompression. And now I wanna show a little bit of the technique, how we actually get there, how we can do that. So, we, so these are all now shown on the right side at the L4, L5 level. Uh, using a uh, 18 millimeter tubular retractor for decompression. Uh, so this is cranial, this is caudal, uh, this is right and left. Uh, the, this is the uh, uh, L4 lamina. So we uh, drill that uh, lamina. Uh, we find either the midline or where the ligament and flavum kind of comes together and there's a little fat pad. Uh, and we go in there and start mobilizing the ligament and flavum, start removing it. And then the key is when you want to go contralateral is that you rotate the table and you angle the tubular retractor so you look more towards the contralateral side and you, then you keep the ligament and flavum intact on the contralateral side here and drill the bone on top of the ligament and flavum so you're not really uh, putting the dura at risk. Uh, you're drilling the bone behind the ligament and that creates enough room so you can then go with your kerosin, kerosin rongeurs in there and very safely remove the ligament and flavum without causing too much compression of the dural sac and the, uh, and the nerve roots. And then you can uh, actually achieve a bilateral decompression and actually a contralateral decompression as well. These are some of the common tools that we use, the tubular retractors. You can use uh, loops with, uh, with a light source. However, uh, a microscopic uh, magnification and visualization is certainly much better. Uh, for this operation, you really only need five or six instruments. You need the kerosene rangers, the nerve hooks, uh, uh, you know, the bayonet and knife if you do a microdiscectomy and so forth. It's a very, very simple operation once you've done it many times. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's the angled uh, 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 drill that we use. Uh, we use a matchstick uh, drill with a blunt tip uh, to protect the dura. Uh, this works very well in, in my hands. And then, uh, however, if you get a spinal, uh, if you get a CSF leak, there are endoscopic dural repair uh, 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 instruments available. These are by Scanlon, uh, where you can put in, um, uh, you, you use these little uh, fish hook needles. If, if, if you have to repair it, you can put in a stitch there and, and get a watertight closure. Again, uh, once you've done this a few times, it's, it's very, very straightforward. Um, uh, we recently wrote it up, uh, the 10-step technique for minimal invasive laminotomy or laminectomy to get a decompression for central lumbar spinal stenosis. I'm not going to go through all the 10 steps. Um, I have a, a short video here that I'm not going to go through, but this is going to be posted uh, at some point um, uh, on YouTube probably for those of you interested. This was actually a 92-year-old physician here at the hospital with severe lumbar spinal stenosis. We treat it uh, through a tubular retractor uh, with a uh, unilateral approach for bilateral laminectomy. And uh, you know, we're exposing the lamina here on the right side, the L4 lamina drilling down, exposing the ligament and flavum right below the lamina. And then, um, and then, um, uh, uh, and then we uh, kind of you know, angle a little bit and then we find the midline uh, between the, the leaves of the ligament and flavum on both sides. And, and then start removing the ligament and flavum with the kerosene rangers. You can see here, we're coming in from the right side. And what is uh, important to realize is that at 90% of your kerosene work, if you come in from the right side, is done towards the caudal end of the retractor. So as a right-handed surgeon, it is probably safer to come in from the right side. So you can do that part of the work, that 90% of the work actually with your right hand so that's where actually what we recommend is uh, that as a right-handed surgeon, you do these operations from the right side and for left-handed surgeon uh, from the left side, it's just a little uh, kind of pearl uh, that, that the residents here find very, very helpful. And then you go contralateral, that's the dual sac exposed already, but now we're going contralateral and removing the, uh, the ligament and flavum on the contralateral side and get a really nice decompression there. And, um, and then we kind of go back to the ipsilateral side and, and decompress it there. So, uh, and then at the end, uh, you can see that that dural sac is really nicely decompressed. And, um, and, uh, and, and, and that's, that's really it. Then we get hemostasis and remove the retractor. So, um, 
uh, again, yeah, we, we recently came out with a book where a lot of these things are being described. One of my co-editors, uh, Andreas Korger, who is an orthopedic spine surgeon in Munich in Germany, he wrote a very nice chapter on, on decompression of lumbar spinal stenosis. In Europe, they use a lot of the spacula, the Casper retractors. We use the tubular retractors. Essentially, it's the same thing. There's no big difference. The idea is you, know, you undercut, you do an over-the-top decompression, you leave all the ligamented structures and the muscles intact, and then you get uh, you know, a really nice decompression as this post-operative MRI scan here shows. Uh, if you look at the evidence, there's no class one evidence, but there's a lot of class three evidence that all suggests that these patients compared to open laminectomy have a, a faster recovery, less blood loss and so forth, and, uh, and, and less infection rate. So um, uh, let, let's talk, uh, so this is the contralateral decompression that you get here with the unilateral approach. Uh, where is that also very helpful? Uh, we find it very helpful in patients who have unilateral radicular symptoms from, uh, uh, from a foraminal disc herniation, for example. So this is a patient here uh, with a L4-5 disc herniation with foraminal compression on the left side. You can see here that exiting left L4 nerve root is compressed. Uh, this is in, in, in a drawing. Uh, and how do you get there? If you do this with an open operation, it's gonna be very difficult to really get to that point here where you can really directly decompress that exiting L4 nerve root under the facet joint. Um, so what we do is in, the, in these cases, we actually come from the contralateral side and we, we do a unilateral uh, laminotomy here. And then we uh, uh, remove the flavum, go contralateral, and then undercut here again, the, undercut the contralateral lamina, undercut the contralateral facet joint, and then visualize the exiting L4 nerve root on the contralateral side. Uh, you can find that herniated disc, you can remove it under the microscope, the beautiful operation. And uh, this is an AP x-ray that we get uh, at the end of the decompression with a nerve hook inserted into the contralateral foramen. And you can see here through the tubular retractor, you can get visualization all the way out to the lateral aspect of the facet joint. So, so really get, you get to decompress that nerve hook all the way out to the contralateral um, exit of the, uh, uh, of the foramen. Uh, and this is under the microscope, again, the contralateral L4 exiting nerve root here at L4-5. And this, again, this is the key. Uh, when you have the tubular retractor in place, you rotate the patient away from you, you angle the tubular retractor a little bit towards you, and that's how you get that visualization of the contralateral spinal canal. You undercut the spinous process, you undercut the lamina, you, you protect the dura by keep it, keeping the ligaments and flavum intact, and, and, and that's that. Uh, we, we wrote this up recently, our experience with a minimally invasive foraminotomy through a contralateral approach in 32 patients. And you could see here, and the, uh, the follow-up was about, uh, was uh, more than a year. So it wasn't terribly long, but it was still, I think, good enough to show you that these patients really do well. Uh, the VAS score on the contralateral side dropped significantly and, and uh, was, the drop was sustained and uh, we really got nice uh, results in these patients. Where are we going next? Uh, you know, we've worked now with percutaneous endoscopy for these uh, foraminotomies to make it even less invasive. And I think, I think there's certainly a, a, a bright future. And I'm, I personally, I'm very, very excited about endoscopy and how we can uh, integrate that into our surgical uh, amenitarium. It will not totally replace what we're doing now with a microscope, but I think it will add to our ability to decompress certain parts of the anatomy where we just really can't get to currently. Now, the first principle I told you was uh, the contralateral decompression uh, or a bilateral decompression uh, through a unilateral approach. Now I wanna talk about how the same type of surgery really minimizes iatrogenic instability. And, uh, and what I mean is uh, that uh, uh, you know many patients, for example, present with uh, spondylolisthesis in the lumbar spine and severe lumbar stenosis, especially elderly patients. And, uh, and the question is always, when in these patients do you do a fusion and when do you just get away with a decompression without a fusion? Now, the current guidelines for uh, the performance of fusion procedures actually recommend that you should probably do a fusion in all of these patients. Everybody who comes in with spondylolisthesis and lumbar stenosis should probably get a fusion if they undergo an open laminectomy. Now, 
uh, I and and that's you know uh, just uh, you know the fusion procedure here, obviously a very invasive procedure. I think, and and a lot of my partners here think also that that we can actually avoid fusion surgery if instead of doing an open laminectomy, uh, if we do a tubular decompression, because we leave all those ligamentous structures, the muscles, the tendons, and everything, we leave everything intact, so we're not really causing any iatrogenic instability. So in these patients, if they have no mechanical back pain, and I know that is sometimes a little bit difficult to tell clinically, but I think with experience as a surgeon, we get a pretty good understanding of who has really mechanical back pain and who doesn't. Plus, if they don't have any abnormal motion on, on flexion extension films, uh, in these patients, what, what I will do, and, and many other surgeons will just do a decompression through a tubular retractor, and we're not gonna do a fusion. And I think, uh, I think that is an important kind of potential advantage of MIS surgery. And, and again, we looked into that. We looked at 110 patients that we treated with a tubular decompression for lumbar spinal stenosis. Uh, half of these patients had spondylolisthesis, the other half did not. Regardless of whether they did or did not have spondylolisthesis, the reoperation and fusion rate over more than two years was 3.5%, so relatively low. And the fact that they had spondylolisthesis uh, did not really increase that reoperation rate. So, so I think that uh, based on these results, which are retrospective class three data, but, but I think based on these results, uh, I will tell my patients that a routine fusion is not indicated in every patient who has lumbar spinal stenosis and spondylolisthesis. So uh, uh, again, if they don't have mechanical back pain, if they don't have abnormal motion on flexion extension films, I will just do a tubular decompression and, uh, and not do a fusion. And um, uh, we, we, uh, one of uh, our fellows, Carsten Schoeller from Germany, who was here recently, did a uh, review on a meta-analysis that's been submitted par uh, currently, looking at studies uh, in patients looking with lumbar spinal stenosis with degenerative spondylolisthesis and comparing MIS laminotomy to tubular or specular retractors versus open laminectomy. And he found that MIS laminotomy in these patients with, you know, so these were almost 1,200 patients in the literature, that the MIS laminotomy was associated, associated with a lower reoperation and fusion rate and greater patient satisfaction than open laminectomy. And the uh, secondary fusion rate with open laminectomy was, was, laminectomy was almost 13% with an MIS for, uh, laminotomy, 3%. So, um, uh, Rick Fessler and his group, uh, obviously, they've, uh, you know, they've wrote about this a lot. Uh, they did a cadaver study where they uh, compared in, in a human spine biomechanical study uh, the impact of an open laminectomy versus a tubular uh, laminotomy, laminectomy, and they also found that a minimal invasive unilateral approach to treat lumbar stenosis produces significantly less biomechanical instability than a traditional midline laminectomy in all modes of testing. So that gives you like the biomechanical proof that what we're doing clinically in these patients is really justified and actually really is because MIS laminotomy causes less instability. Now what happens in patients who have multi-level lumbar spinal stenosis? Uh, as you all know, many of our patients come in, they may have two or three, sometimes even four levels of lumbar spinal stenosis. So how do we treat those patients? And can we treat those patients uh, in a similar fashion? Now, Michael Meyer uh, wrote about this and uh, he's a skier and he compared the technique that they use uh, with a slalom technique. And what he means by that is that patients who come in, for example, in this case, a patient with four, with four level lumbar spinal stenosis or three level lumbar spinal stenosis or four levels, they will actually treat through separate incisions from separate sides uh, uh, for uh, each level of uh, lumbar stenosis. And, and what that does is that it kind of uh, distributes the amount of bone resection that you perform as a surgeon on both sides, and it minimizes the overall destabilizing impact of your operation. And, and, um, and, and we do that, in, in my practice, we do that uh, in patients with multi-level lumbar stenosis. As a matter of fact, we sometimes bring in two microscopes and you know, the resident does one side, I do the other side. It's a great way to get residents and fellows involved in this operation. And we bring in two tubular retractors, two drills, 
Obviously, that is not always possible. It depends on uh, what's going on <laughs> in the operating room and the other rooms. But it's, uh, it's sometimes we do two-level T-lift surgery uh, with the same uh, setup with two microscopes. Certainly cuts down on the time of the operation. It's better for the patient and it's easier time, and um, and it works really really well. Now, what I want to uh, draw your attention to sometimes, if you do a lot of these tubular uh, decompressions, um, what happens is in patients with lumbar spinal stenosis, you really have to study the preoperative MRI scan very very carefully, especially the sagittal T2-weighted image, because as you can see here. And with open surgery, uh, it's not that uh, important because you have better visualization. But if you look through a small tubular retractor, you may miss the fact that the worst part of the lumbar spinal stenosis in this patient, for example, is way below the disc space. It's almost half the way down the, beyond the vertebral body. Versus in this patient here, the lumbar stenosis is actually exactly at the level of the disc, uh, of the disc space. So you have to kind of look at these little details if you do a lot of tubular surgery because otherwise you'll end up with a suboptimal uh, result. So you, you really have to be very, very meticulous. Now, uh, we all, for example, uh, synovial uh, uh, cysts, patients who come in with uh, facet joint cysts, uh, we treat uh, also with tubular retractor, and we actually uh, treat them through a contralateral approach because we like to come in from uh, 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 the healthy side, find normal dura first, and then isolate that and dissect the cyst of the normal dura and then remove the cyst with the kerosene rongeurs. This also minimizes the impact on the facet joint. We wrote that up a few years ago. It works very well in our patients, and I think also we can avoid a lot of fusion surgery in these patients. Now, uh, uh, I want to summarize kind of what we uh, learned uh, with uh, uh, what we learned about tubular decompression surgery in the lumbar spine. Um, so, what I teach my residents and fellows here is that. Patients who come in with foraminal stenosis, like with a foraminal disc herniation, with a unilateral radiculopathy, we will treat from a contralateral approach through a tubular retractor. If a patient comes in with central spinal stenosis uh, with uh, neurogenic claudication, uh, a right-sided approach for right-handed surgeon is probably better. A left-sided approach is better for a left-handed surgeon. One or two levels we treat through one incision, uh, patients who have three or four level stenosis, we do the so-called slot technique through multiple incisions from both sides. Uh, patients with, with lateral recess stenosis, we treat from, uh, from the same side, uh, from the ipsilateral side, same with the disc herniation. And synovial cyst patients, we will typically treat from a contralateral approach. So these are some of the pros that kind of work in our practice here and uh, that we teach our, our fellows. Now, the third principle I want to talk about is indirect decompression. And uh, that refers to the fact that, um, uh, that mill invasive surgery uh, allows indirect decompression of central and foraminal stenosis in selected patients. Uh, this was described already in the 1980s. Uh, this was done with myelography in patients who underwent ALIF surgery in Asia, where they looked before and after surgery uh, at the foraminal, uh, the, the the radicular sheath of the foramen, and they uh, saw that uh, on the myelo myelography, there was a significant increase before and after placement of a cage, and then also the fecal sac here, that the central canal stenosis significantly improved after placement of the cage. This is obviously then uh, translated now into the x or e lift surgery or the translumbar transor surgery, where you go in from the side with a minimal invasive approach, place a cage, and uh, uh, this is illustrated here by placing the cage, you kind of get this great uh, central decompression, but also foraminal decompression. And that, that's what we call indirect decompression. Uh, now, I want to show an example of a patient who has a very significant degenerative scoliosis, but presents with a very focal finding, namely a right L3-4 radicular pain syndrome. And uh, so right-sided thigh pain. And this patient had severe L3, L4 collapse with right-sided severe foraminal and nerve fluid compression, as you can see here on the MRI scan. And again, here on the right side, you can see that nerve fluid being compressed. And that's what we did. We did a focal, just a one-level uh, cage implantation in this patient for treatment of this very uh, isolated finding. This patient did not have a lot of mechanical back pain. And then we supplemented it with a plate. This was done a number of years ago. 
holes now is I use a plate with four screws, which uh, mechanically I think is more stable. Back then this plate had only two screws. Uh, but you can see here 15 months postoperatively, this patient did extremely well. The frame is completely decompressed. Uh, uh, three, four, that was before surgery, that was after surgery, that nerve root is totally decompressed, and that patient did very well. Now, uh, uh, and then again, we, we wrote this up in 23 patients, uh, one year follow up, uh, a single level X lift for, uh, for uh, radicular pain. Uh, this is the foraminal height that went up after surgery. That's the VAS pain for, uh, for leg and buttock that significantly decreased. Now, we also looked at a study recently at uh, what are the factors that determine the success of indirect decompression in X lift surgery? Is it cage width? Is it, is it cage height, cage positioning? and so forth. Is it uh, using lodotic or parallel cages? Uh, and uh, what we found is that really the only of all the factors studied, and this is in 90 patients, of all the factors, only the cage width significantly determines the success of indirect decompression in terms of foraminal decompression and disc height uh, elevation. Uh, and uh, so uh, the cages are that we look compared was, were 18 versus 22 millimeters. So the 22 millimeter cages were significantly more successful in uh, affording foraminal decompression and disc height uh, uh, improvement in these patients. Uh, we also looked at facet joints, uh, in, and, and this is currently being uh, submitted also for publication, where we looked at the, uh, uh, the amount of degeneration of the facet joints and how that um, uh, affects uh, the success of foraminal decompression, and we found that lower facet tropism is associated with a greater foraminal extension. So if you have healthy facets, you get a much better indirect decompression than if you have uh, 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 bad facets. Now, that's wh where I want to leave it in terms of like what I would consider the principles of MIS surgery, like decompression surgery and the indirect decompression uh, surgery. Um, I, uh, uh, and I want to talk now for the next uh, six, seven minutes, I wanna talk about uh, uh, navigation because uh, I think as microsurgeons, as important as it is to uh, master uh, these microsurgical decompression techniques under the microscope, it is also important we have to navigate. We have to know where we are gonna put our instrumentation, our screws, and even in terms of the decompression, where do we have to decompress under the microscope? And that's where the navigation really comes in very, very handy. And uh, I, um, and, and, and what I want to tell you is that navigation obviously increases implant accuracy. We've got very, very good evidence showing that. But in addition to that, the new generation um, uh, uh, navigation systems facilitate MIS in many other, other ways as well. Uh, yeah, there's less need for fluoroscopy. Um, uh, if you do a lot of uh, uh, K-wire surgery with, with cannulated screws, you can use navigation to totally eliminate K-wires uh, and, and fluoroscopy during those cases. We use navigation now in 70% of our cases for total navigation, meaning we, we navigate every step of the procedure and we don't use fluoroscopy, nobody wears lead, and uh, it's just uh, has really facilitated and made a lot of the operations that we do now much easier for, for everybody involved. Uh, uh, we published this a number of years ago uh, and it was a meta-analysis, 20 studies. A navigation decreases perforation rate of pedicle screws in the lumbar and thoracic spine from 15 to 6%. Uh, and, and there are many other studies that show exactly the same thing. So I think there can be no doubt that navigation is gonna make you a more accurate surgeon in terms of instrumentation uh, uh, placement. Um, now, the latest generation uh, scanners that are out there are really intraoperative CT scanners that work very, uh, uh, very smoothly with uh, or integrated with an operating room table with a navigation. Now there are several systems out there. There's obviously one one particular company, but there are several systems out there that all do very much uh, similar similar job. And uh, so as I mentioned now, using these new new high resolution and really much better quality navigation systems we eliminate fluoroscopy in about 70% of our cases. We use navigation not only for placement of the pedicle screws, but also for the skin incision, for planning of the instrumentation, the screw placement, for placement of the tubular retractors, 
for the decompression part of the operation, for putting the cage in, for rod measurement, and for final uh, CT check, and, and, and so forth. So it really becomes kind of second nature. I want to show you the example of a case uh, where we kind of bring everything together. This is a patient who uh, presented with spondylolisthesis at L4-5 with severe lumbar stenosis, with moderate stenosis at L3-4, and with foraminal stenosis at L5-S1, and I'll show that here. So this is at L3-4. This patient had moderate stenosis here, severe lumbar stenosis with spondylolisthesis at L4-5, and then with left foraminal compression and severe L5 nerve root compression on the left side at L5-S1. Now, uh, what we decided to do in this patient was to do a L4-5 T-lift uh, because he had instability at that level and significant slip, uh, and then do a decompression at L3-4 through tubular retractors and a foraminal decompression through a tubular retractor from a contralateral approach at L5-S1. Now, I understand that this may be a little bit controversial. However, this is kind of how we treat a lot of these patients now, and I think it works extremely well. Uh, if, you, if you do it correctly, if you use the right technology and the right indications. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we use navigation uh, for this case. So there's no fluoroscopy used in this operation. The patient is scanned in the operating room. Uh, in order to increase the accuracy of your navigation, it's very important that we tape down the patient to the operating room table. Obviously, you've got to be careful when you do that, but that really increases the accuracy of, of your navigation. The reference array is placed uh, uh, on the iliac crest, uh, and, then, uh, and then we navigate off that, we get the scan, and then we start navigating from the very beginning, even for the skin incision. We determine the skin incision with navigation, and we make a skin, skin incision where we have the optimal trajectory for placement of all the pedicle screws. That's where we're going to make our skin incision. We use an, once we have a skin incision and we place our navigated guide tube, we use this instrument, which is a guide tube that allows you to drill a hole to tap and place a pedicle screw uh, through one instrument. And, and that greatly facilitates placement of our pedicle screws. There's no need for K-wire and no need for fluoroscopy. This was written up a number of years ago here uh, by our group. And again, it's, it's one instrument that allows you to drill a hole to tap and then put in a pedicle screw, in this case, a pedicle screw without a screw head, and then we attach the screw head uh, later together with the towers. Um, um, and this is uh, uh, the step, this is the navigated guide tube in place. You can see the navigation here. We drill a hole with a battery drill. Uh, we drill a hole uh, based on the navigation. Uh, the drill goes in 35 millimeters, never deeper. That way, you don't have to use fluoroscopy because 35 millimeters is never, it's never going to be too deep. We drill a hole, uh, then we, uh, we tap, we tap that hole, and then, uh, and basically then uh, we tap and we leave it in place. We, we call it the hands-off test, make sure uh, everything is in good position. We take the tap out, and then essentially uh, after that, we place, we place the screw and uh, we have a little ball tip that we use to feel the hole. Uh, we place the screw. So every, every screw takes about two minutes here. No KY is used. And, uh, and then now we're put, putting in the screw. So we put in all the screws, uh, third screw, fourth screw, and then we use navigation for bone harvesting. We harvest bone from the iliac crest here. Uh, and I uh, use autograph bone for the, for the interbody fusion. These are the two incisions. Now we've got the two incisions in place. We placed screws on both sides. Now we use navigation to place the tubular retractor. Uh, so we, we, in this case, we place two tubular retractors, one on the right side, one on the left side. Uh, this is the navigation star in place. Uh, so from the right side, we put in the screws, obviously, on the right side. And this, this opening we're going to use for the left-sided L5 as one for aminotomy. Through the left-sided uh, tubular retractor, uh, we will do the L3-4 laminectomy and the L4-5 laminectomy and interbody fusion. Uh, and again, you can use two microscopes if you have that available. Uh, it obviously doesn't work always, but if we have it, it's great. Cuts down on the time. Uh, we use navigation to find the, uh, you know, the, there's a significant slip here. So we find the disk space, insert the, uh, uh, the, the probe into the disk space here, uh, determine the size, the position of the cage with navigation. And then uh, we use uh, 
uh, you know, we place under the, this is all done under the microscope again. We place the, uh, uh, the, uh, the cage under the microscope. Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't navigate every instrument. So I only navigate uh, the, uh, the um, I, only, I only use the probe. That gives me enough information to really place that cage correctly. So once the cage is in, I confirm by putting in the, uh, uh, the, uh, the navigation probe, make sure that the position of the cage is adequate. Uh, we put that cage a little bit deeper uh, uh, later on. But now that you can see here uh, on the navigation screen, a little bit hidden, but that cage is in a good position. We've got to put it a little bit deeper, which we did. And, and, and so, but essentially the idea is that you navigate the whole case. And uh, so in this case, again, we did the T lift here with the laminectomy here, foraminotomy there. This patient that was done about a year and a half ago, that patient's doing very good, very well. And again, the idea is to use navigation for 100% of the surgery. And, um, and, uh, and that's really it. I, uh, I don't want to take too much more time because uh, I think there may be some questions. So um, I, um, I, I want to thank you for your attention. And, um, and I hope that you got something out of this. But, and I'll, I'm open for your questions. Thank you, Dr. Hartle, for a very informative and enjoyable presentation. We will now begin the Q&A portion of the program. As a reminder, you can submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Our presenter will attempt to answer as many questions as he can during the time we have for Q&A. <coughs> and the first question I have here is, in which clinical applications is the use of the microscope a must for you, and why? In which clinical application is it a must? Uh, well, I think in, in exactly these uh, these ap uh, applications that I just showed, I think as soon as as we start operating through tubular retractors, or uh, we operate, uh, uh, you know, uh, through a limited access port. I think uh, using the microscope is a huge advantage. It illuminates, it gives you a uh, great visualization of the anatomy, it gives you the magnification that you need. Um, there are surgeons who do this without a microscope and that's certainly you know, preference, obviously. Um, in my opinion, there's no reason why you would not want to do this under the microscope. I think it makes you a more accurate, a safer surgeon. You have an assistant on the other side who sees exactly what you're seeing. It's good for training purposes. Uh, you can, you know, you can take pictures. You, you know, can record videos. Uh, I mean, it's just the abundance of advantages. So, uh, you know, we, uh, we 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 train surgeons in Tanzania. This next week, we're going to go back to Tanzania, and and uh, we actually brought over two two microscopes, and we're actually training uh, orthopedic and, and neurosurgery spine surgeons over there and, and using the microscope. And, um, and, and I can understand that it takes sometimes surgeons a while to really get used to it. And uh, for some reason, what we consider an obvious advantage uh, for surgeons who've never used the microscope is sometimes difficult to understand. Uh, but I can only encourage that, uh, you know, maybe go to a cadaver course or work with one of your colleagues who uses a microscope. Uh, there's really almost no disadvantage in my opinion. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Hartle. Um, the next one is, how do you go about getting the appropriate training for the MIS surgery? Yeah, I think that is a challenge sometimes. Um, now, uh, you know, there are excellent courses out there uh, that are being offered by either companies or by organizations such as you know, the AO. Um, in a very self-promotional fashion, I put uh, our course up here on the, on the screen. Uh, you know, we, we, we've done courses every year in December at Cornell, but there are many, many other courses out there in St. Louis and other places, excellent cadaver courses that you can participate in. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's really important. And you really got to dedicate, you got to find a course that spends a lot of time in the cadaver lab. Um, and, then, and then I think uh, maybe a good idea is to, to visit somebody who does a lot of MIS surgery and just watch them. I mean, you learn so much just by watching surgeons, and um, and then and then start using it for simple uh, 
start using tubular retractors, uh, not for a T lift, but start using it for microdiscectomy or for laminectomy first, and then kind of slowly take it from there. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Um, the next question is, um, does the use of the microscope influence the occurrence of complications? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Sure. Um, does the m use of the microscope influence um, the occurrence of complications? You know, I, I, I think it's, it, I think it decreases it, uh, certainly in my experience. Uh, I think it's hard to, um, it's hard to quantify because nobody has really studied that in a, in a randomized fashion. But um, I mean, uh, for example, I, I would find it very difficult to, to effectively uh, treat a, a dural tear without a microscope and, and really get watertight closure. Uh, as I get older, my eyesight is probably not as good either, <laughs> but I, uh, I, without a microscope and without, without adequate magnification, it's hard for me to imagine how I would really adequately treat that without a scope. And, uh, and, I, and certainly also the occurrence of, 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 of CSF leaks is, is probably lower if you use a microscope because you just see better with better magnification and, and be better uh, illumination, you know? Absolutely, that makes sense. Um, and then the next question is, how does um, the microscope benefit you? Um, well, uh, in terms of my own uh, surgical um, technique, you know, I, in terms of the posture, I mean, you stand upright, you don't have to, um, you know, if you, if you use the microscope correctly, you can use it very, very ergonomically. Uh, and, uh, and I think it just helps you in terms of your own posture and your own well-being during the operation, especially if you do a lot of these cases every day and every week. Uh, so it just allows you a more normal posture in the operating room. Sure. All right, the next question I have here is, will the investment in the microscope pay off? And if so, what, after what time or how many patients? Now, that's a difficult question to answer. I, I, is it going to pay off? I think if you, um, if you, I mean, my practice, if I think about the number of complications that I have avoided by using a microscope because I just could see better, uh, then, then it certainly paid off probably within a relatively short time period. I cannot give you uh, a certain time frame, but uh, I mean, my practice, I would never do an operation without a microscope because you just, I couldn't do it safely. So uh, again, I, I don't know if there's any literature in terms of the cost effectiveness of using the microscope, but, um, uh, but, but I think it, it probably pays off very, very quickly because, because you just avoid having like major complications in the operating room, such as nerve injury, CSF leaks, uh, uh, all these things that could potentially significantly increase risk. Absolutely, that makes sense. Uh, do you think uh, using the microscope is just a temporary hype or a more long-term trend? Well, as I showed in the beginning, I mean, the first operating microscope uh, came, came out in the 1950s. So we've had operating microscopes, you know, for, you know, uh, for like 60 years now, more than 60 years, and they're only becoming more uh, uh, popular. Now, we, uh, I think there's no, there's no reason to believe that microscopes would not be around. I think there may be uh, maybe a uh, an addition of other techniques. You know, the the endoscope maybe to a certain extent for some applications. But I think that uh, for the majority of of middle invasive uh, microsurgical cases, the microscope is is a total a must and and is not going to go away anytime soon. Absolutely perfect. Um, how do you describe the difference in the role of the endoscope versus a microscope? In minimally invasive spine surgery. <laughs> yeah, you know that's an interesting question. I mean, uh, I think that um, the role of the endoscope right now is not totally well defined. I think uh, I mean, uh, the, the role of the endoscope is not totally well defined and, dis and and really clear. 
you know, the endoscope of the, I, I, would sh I, I should say the percutaneously inserted endoscope uh, has been around for a number of years now. It's currently, I think, experiencing a little bit of a renaissance and maybe a, for spinal surgery, uh, but on a very, very low level. Uh, and I think we have to see, I, I think uh, there are certain parts of the anatomy, as I mentioned in my talk, for example, you know, uh, pyramidal decompression, that may be very, very difficult to achieve sometimes with uh, the technology that we have available with tubular retractors and the microscope. And, and in some cases using the endoscope uh, inserted percutaneously, uh, that may actually give you certain advantages. Uh, so we have to see if that really turns out to be the case. Um, uh, so I think, in my opinion, I think at the end of the day, it's probably gonna be additive and it's not gonna be instead of the microscope, but I think it's gonna uh, potentially add to the overall uh, success and, uh, and, and, and really uh, uh, abilities that we have as, as MIS surgeons. Absolutely, perfect. Um, and I think we have time for one more question. So the last question I have today is, um, is it difficult to use the microscope during spine surgery and does it prolong the case? Uh, the microscope through what? Can you repeat that? Is it yes? Is it difficult to use during spine surgery, and does it prolong the case? The microscope? No, yes. uh, obviously not. No, I mean it's like everything else. Uh, you, you have to get used to it. You have to use it a few times. If you've never used the microscope, it, you know it's going to be a little bit more difficult. But uh, uh, you know, I mean, in my practice. I, we use the microscope for almost every case, so it's 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 really a, a it's a routine uh, uh, occurrence, and and that means that you know the scrub nurse, uh, the people who set up the operating room, everybody knows that the microscope is part of the operation, and that makes it easy, you know, because because I don't have to tell anybody what to do; they all know that we're going to use the microscope. So once it becomes really part of the operation. Uh, but, and, and once you realize that you really work as a team, and that means that you have to spend time with your team and you have to educate them, uh, but that you know, happens over time, then, then uh, using the microscope is going to be second nature. You know, it's, it's, it's such, just like using navigation. You know, navigation is a good example also. That if you've never used it, it's going to be very, very difficult. Once you've used it a number of times, it becomes second nature. Everybody else knows how to uh, help you using it, and, and then that's where the team effort comes in. Absolutely perfect. Well, I want to thank our presenter for his excellent presentation and all of you for participating today. We look forward to having you join us for future webinars. This concludes today's program. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Same to you and to everybody else.